Hello, everyone, and welcome to NYC Builds Bio virtual webinar in collaboration with Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News and Ventas. The webinar is entitled Shut Down STEM and Black Lives Matter, a call for diversity in science, medicine, and academia. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Nancy Kelly, and I serve on the steering committee and as a founding member of NYC Builds Bio. I would like to acknowledge the founding and corporate members of our organization who make this programming possible. I also want to thank Tim Sanders, Senior Investment Officer at Ventas, for supporting this webinar through a leadership sponsorship. Tim has been employed with Ventas since 2015 and is responsible for originating life science real estate acquisitions in the eastern half of the United States and Canada. He works on ground up mixed use developments, including labs, office, hotel, and residential located on or adjacent to university campuses, including Brown, Washington University, Penn, and University of Maryland. Tim is currently responsible for over 1 million square feet of development projects expected to deliver in 2020 and 2021. Prior to Ventas, he enjoyed a long career in commercial banking and corporate finance at GE Capital Healthcare, Financial Services, Marathon Asset Management, Capital Funding Group, SunTrust, and the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. He received his BA from Howard University and MBA from the University of Pittsburgh. Today we focus on a topic that is extremely important to the life science industry, the deep disparity in representation, retention, and recruitment of black scientists and doctors in academia, science, and medicine. This is also true of senior positions in the financial professional design services and construction industries in New York. Since 2010, nearly $1 billion has been invested in commercial life science projects in New York. That number is expected to double to over $2.3 billion in the next several years, an opportunity for economic growth and job description, job creation that must be shared by all. This webinar is part of an ongoing series of events hosted by NYC Builds Bio. We have posted the schedule of events for the rest of July and September on the website and hope you will join us. If you weren't able to attend our past events, please check out these programs on the website. Today we welcome a stellar panel of black senior executives led by Anthony Johnson, CEO of Kodakaz from academia, pharma, biotech, medicine, and venture capital who will talk about their experiences and the road to new solutions ahead. We will hear from Angel Palermo, Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, Chief Program Officer, Co-Founder, Diversity Innovation Hub of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Asha Collins, Head of US Country Clinical Operations at Genentech and an Aspen Institute Health Innovators Fellow. Emmanuel Fambu, venture partner at Fund RX, VP Locust Walk Partners, and author The Future of Healthcare. His prior work includes appointments as medical director at Novartis, Bayer, and Johnson and Johnson. And Mark Hicks, associate scientist, cell biology, lab manager, and health safety environment representative, Laxo Oncology at Eli Lilly Corporation. Thanks to you all for joining us today for this important discussion. Before we begin, I just wanted to cover a few administrative details. There's a program and PowerPoint highlighting the hosts and speakers for the meeting. These will be posted on our website after the meeting. The program's being recorded and we will be distributed to all registrants. If anyone is having technical difficulties accessing the Zoom room or other issues, please email info at nycbuildsbio.org or send a notice through the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Since most of you are participating in listen only mode, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. 
We will open up for discussion and Q&A at the end of the program and will address as many audience questions as possible. At the end of the meeting, we will have a chance for smaller randomized groups to meet in separate rooms where you can open your videos and microphones and talk to each other. You can stay as long as you like and get to know each other and share stories. Now I will open it up to Tim Sanders who will give some opening remarks on behalf of Ventas. Tim? Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Uh, as Nancy said, uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. As Nancy said, I'm Tim Sanders. Tim, I think you're muted. You're muted. Ah. Okay. Let's take. Can you hear? Uh, yeah. Now you're fine. Yep. We got you. You're fine. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, as Nancy said, um, I'm happy to be here. My name is Tim Sanders, a senior investment officer at Ventos. Uh, Ventos is a healthcare focused real estate investment trust. For context, we are a long term holder of real estate, owning and investing in over 1,200 properties across the healthcare spectrum, from senior living communities to medical office buildings, research innovation, and life science communities. I've been with the company for over five years. Let me tee up today's discussion with some sobering statistics. STEM diversity numbers are not very good. According to a 2018 Pew Research study, Blacks make up 11% of the US workforce overall, but just 9% of STEM workers. That number drops to 7% when you consider employed African-American adults with a bachelor's degree. Now, I don't have a STEM background, but I work in commercial real estate and our industry numbers are even worse. Current data is hard to come by, but a 2013 report that analyzed census and EEOC data and has been cited in recent news articles found that approximately 78% of senior executives in commercial real estate were white men, 14% were white women, black men were just 1.3% and non-white women barely registered. Now I'm not surprised by those numbers. I've been doing this for more than 20 years and have often wondered why there are so few people who look like me. There are of course many factors, but I attribute it to two reasons. The first is institutional. At the nucleus of most commercial real estate companies is a small family owned business. And as those companies grew, they typically hired and promoted other family members and their friends. The second element is a little more esoteric and nuanced and it relates to exposure. And that's an area where I'd like to dive in a little further and open up today's discussion. Today, many talented and capable children of color aren't pursuing careers in STEM fields because in most cases, they don't think it's attainable. They aren't exposed to role models in the STEM profession who look like them, whether in a personal or family setting or when watching characters on television and in movies. One of the ways we can help to change the future of these young people is through mentorship programs and academic opportunities to enlighten them on the breadth of potential career paths that are available to them. Let me share one example. The Cambridge Innovation Center, more commonly known as CIC, is a co-working space not unlike WeWork or Convene. They provide office and lab space for early stage research and innovation companies. They are also known for their programming for tenants and community outreach for local residents. CIC is a Ventas tenant in one of our life science buildings in Philadelphia, and one of their major community outreach programs is called First Hand, a free program underwritten by corporate sponsors that provide students with first-hand experience of working in lab spaces to learn, take ownership, build confidence, and transform themselves into real scientists. They work on everything from DNA to synthetic biology and polymer experiments. I'm not really sure what all that means, but I'm sure all of you do. The program is open to middle and high school students in Philly. Participants also get to work with assigned mentors from the Philadelphia life science and university communities. Almost 400 kids participated in the program in 2019, supported by 60 mentors. Can you imagine how many impressionable minds are being opened to careers in science and STEM through this program? As they describe on their website, they are opening the doors for the minds of tomorrow. Mentorships are a great source of advice, narrative education, a feedback outlet, advocacy, and people who can be there for the professional and the personal. So how can you help define and develop these relationships? I propose engaging at the high school level. New York City has some of the best high schools in the country, so consider reaching out to connect with the students at Brooklyn Tech, 
the Bronx High School of Science, and Stuyvesant, to name a few, to create mentor programs to connect with the younger generation. I've read that it helps to have men mentors and mentees that don't look like you. Mentees not only benefit from professional guidance, but also gain expertise dipped in the lived experience of their mentor. With a different way of experience in life, mentors get to shed light on how they navigate the world and how the world experiences them. Mentorship is also a two-way street. The mentors are able to broaden their worldview through interaction with the mentees, providing them a glimpse of the personal struggles and achievement of the students. And this can only help knock down some of the societal barriers dividing us as a people today. Another approach is to consider recruiting a technical job, excuse me, technical colleges for tech jobs that don't require a four-year degree, such as lab assistants. A great example of this strategy is Catalyte, a workforce data science company. Catalyte believes that aptitude is equally distributed, but opportunity is not, and uses a proprietary mechanism to test inner city residents for their aptitude to learn to code. Since they select individuals based on aptitude, not pedigree, their employees reflect the diversity of their local communities, which translates into higher revenue and better performance for their clients and provides new opportunities for sustainable and diverse tech talent to accelerate business outcomes in the software engineering field. Finally, recruiting at the 100 or so historically black colleges and universities, otherwise known as HBCUs, is another avenue to improve diversity metrics in the STEM field. Did you know that 22% of African Americans with a bachelor's and 30% with graduate degrees in STEM are HBCU alumni? Or that eight HBCUs were among the top 20 institutions to award STEM degrees to African Americans? As we start the discussion, let me leave you with this. Studies indicate that people of color, the people of color population will double in size from 18% in 1980, 37% now, and a majority of the working class by 2032 and the white workforce will decline. The time is now to do the work to prepare for that shift. To improve the diversity statistics in the STEM industry, we must think outside the box and not remain tethered to the traditional way of doing things, all of which will improve the quality of work by providing diverse perspectives and richer interactions among colleagues. Thank you very much. Before I turn it over to our moderators, I'd like to introduce one of our moderators, which is Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson is an experienced executive with a strong track record of leadership across the healthcare sector. His experience has covered a multitude of areas, including sales, marketing, and strategy and business development. Having lived and worked in Europe, South America, and the USA, Mr. Johnson brings an international perspective and diversity of domestic and international experiences to his work. Anthony is the former president and CEO of Empire Genomics, a preeminent oncology genomic molecular diagnostic company. As the founding CEO of Empire, he led the business through multiple funding rounds, acquisitions, licensing, in addition to staffing and setting business strategy. Under his guidance, Empire was able to launch companion diagnostic assays, obtain CAP and CLIA certifications, CE marking, and move three times to accommodate business growth. Anthony also find it, founded Buffalo Biosciences, BBS, a technology investment and management firm. At BBS, Anthony worked with clients, including tech transfer offices, numerous startups, in addition to state and local governments to guide them in their focus on healthcare endeavors. A major accomplishment that Anthony led on behalf of BBS was the firm's participation in the creation and launch of the New York STEM Genome Center. Prior to Buffalo Biosciences, he led the stem cell and cell therapy divisions for IVGN Corporation. In this capacity, he was responsible for sales, marketing, and business development. In this role, Mr. Johnson was responsible for IVGN's participation in the creation of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, $3 billion bond issuance to support stem cell research in the state. Mr. Johnson holds a bachelor's degree from Fisk University and HBCU located in Nashville, Tennessee, and an MBA from the Alliance Manchester Business School in Manchester, England. He's a fellow of the Aspen Institute's Health Innovators Fellowship and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderators, Anthony Johnson and Nancy Kelly for a very exciting program. Thank you for your time and attention. Great, greatly appreciate it, greatly appreciate it. And, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I believe in being in brevity. I think that um, I wanna kind of juxtapose this conversation with two different data points. One is reinforcing kind of 
Nancy's point of over 1.1 billion has been spent in life science endeavors in New York City since 2010. And that number is going to double to 2.3 million over the next several years. So there's a tremendous economic opportunity here, but I want to put that against the bookend of the COVID outbreak, obviously, that has killed over 50% of African American and Latino populations. And it just highlights the disparities that exist. And I think that what we've done in curating this group of executives across the board is you'll see that these are people that are tremendous success in terms of their professional endeavors. They cover everything from venture capital to development like Tim Sanders, the bench top scientists, as well as care delivery and the pharmaceutical sectors. And so um, this is meant to be a discussion and dialogue. And I hope that you'll learn to understand that these statistics are not only appalling, but they, they run the gamut of everything from participation in clinical trials, research dollars, site selection committees, development, and then board level and executives. And I hope that this dialogue will be the start of many more to start addressing some of these issues. And so with that, I wanna go around and have um, each member of the panel introduce themselves and give a bit about kind of their day-to-day -day experience and their um, job description of current, me, in terms of what they currently do. And with that, maybe we'll start with um, Angel Perlarmo first. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you uh, for the invitation to be part of this important discussion. Uh, one of many discussions, this is not the only discussion we should be having in this space, um, and it's not a fix-it discussion. I just want to say that as well. Uh, I'm Angel Palermo. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at the Icon School of Medicine on Sinai. I'm also with our health system-wide office for diversity and inclusion. Um, I've been at Mount Sinai for over 20 years, working at the intersection of diversity affairs and academic medicine and public health. And um, you know, I just want to point out that uh, a part of this space includes right physicians and scientists, and the and I often talk about the MD plus or the PhD plus, and that plus is really this intersection of their training in medicine and science with um, technology and health technology, as well as other areas of uh, outside of medicine science that can be integrated in really taking care, better care of, of patients and ultimately communities and populations. I just want to add some more data um, why offices like diversity and inclusion are important, but not the fix-it solution. So in the United States, among active physicians, uh, it, 52, over 56% identify as white, 17.1 uh, identifies Asian, 5.8 identify as Hispanic, and 5% identify as Black or African American. And um, you know, the racial ethnic breakdown. When we think about PhD recipients, uh, and I specifically will speak to just those that are receiving funding through the NIH, right? The national, probably global funder of of research in this, in not only this country but perhaps in the world. Um, the, this, the, the statistics are not that far uh, off in terms of the, the trend. And so uh, according to the National Institutes of Health and their most recent uh, data analysis, uh, NIH supported PhD recipients in 2017, 67% identified as white, 14% identified as Asian, 9% identified as Hispanic, and 5% identified as black. And so if we uh, recognize that you know, having these credentials matter uh, and they symbolize expertise, they symbolize credibility, they symbolize, um, quite frankly, uh, uh, power and privilege inside of expertise, then we have to do a much better job in, in, in not only addressing the pipeline, uh, but really perhaps transforming the narrative of what does excellence and, um, and, uh, and, and um, discovery and and, and, and um, new ideas and where does that come from? Um, and I just wanna say that because part of, a, of what I've um, newly connected to is our diversity innovation hub that we launched just under a year ago is very new, dih.co. Uh, and um, you know, our, we have three main, main areas of focus. One is to accelerate the, uh, the participation of women and people of color in the health tech space. Uh, two, to really innovate inside of the diversity, equity, inclusion space, and then also really create an, a uh, an incubator to nurture and foster the development of solutions to address structural and social determinants of health. And that these ideas don't have to come necessarily from the MDs and PhDs, 
but those who are in alternate, uh, perhaps non-traditional spaces as well, and what are and, and, and leveraging that potential. So I will stop there because I know we have others on the panel. We have a lot to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Great, great introduction. With that, let's move on to um, Dr. Mar I mean Mark Hicks, actually. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Uh, so I'm Mark Hicks. I'm a research scientist, laboratory manager, and health safety and environment representative for Loxville Oncology at Eli Lilly. Uh, I've been doing this for about a year and a half, and before that I worked for a company known as Petropharma Corporation, where we developed our own novel cancer therapeutics. Um, Mark, I don't know if others, maybe, can everybody hear his volume level? Yeah, if you could speak up a little bit, that would be great. Okay, okay. I'll bring the mic closer. Is this a little better? There you go. Perfect. Fantastic. So yeah, after uh, uh, coming from Petropharma, uh, we actually became part of Loxo Oncology. Um, before that, I was in Richmond, Virginia, where I worked at Virginia Commonwealth University, and I got a lot of experience uh, working in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology as well as doing cancer research. Um, my path is a little bit non-traditional as I actually don't have any advanced degrees. I just have a bachelor's degree in environmental studies, um, but I've worked in the research science field over the past 12 or 13 years to kind of move my way up the mountain, as it were, to get to the point I'm at now. Um, to speak to some other points that were already brought up, you know, during my time coming up, I didn't see too many other people like me or from my background. Um, and that's not to say that the people that I worked with weren't excellent human beings because they were, but sometimes it is a good experience to have other people around you who you can go to directly you know, and follow their lead. And so in progressing to where I have today and trying to help people and motivate people as I have over the years, you know, I hope to show that uh, to a younger generation of people who are trying to make their way into STEM that it can be done and it can be done in a non-traditional format. Um, you still can make it if you really put forth great effort and if you really have good people to turn to. So there's my spiel. Uh, Asha, do you want to go next? Yes. No. <laughs> next question. Sorry, I was just getting off the of mute. <laughs> Lost my cursor for a second. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, and Nancy and Anthony, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here today with this really great group of people. I'm really excited um, and honored to be here. Um, and then just thank you for, for sponsoring as well, too. I really appreciate that as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll give an overview of, of my background and sort of where I landed. And sort of like Mark's is a bit circuitous, not completely direct. Uh, so I'm trained as a cancer virologist. I yes, have a PhD uh, focusing on viruses that cause cancer. Uh, and, but after uh, my graduate and postdoc work, I actually left the bench and I went to DC. I actually moved into science policy. And there I was a AAAS science policy fellow for um, a couple of years. And actually even before that, I worked at the National Academies and because I was a virologist, I actually got the opportunity to work in bioterrorism for, uh, during the four fellowship, and then moved into um, other science policy areas at the National Cancer Institute, where I worked for a number of years um, around everything in um, cancer genomics. I was there during the, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, uh, where patient privacy and uh, privacy and data rights were a significant issue, um, as they still are. Um, but in, for a long story short, I just worked in DC in science policy for a number of years and then actually transitioned into management consulting, where I then began working with not just the large scientific agencies, but also then start moving into working with pharma companies and biotech companies and helping them optimize their operations. And that's really sort of where I've sort of landed my career. So a lot of the work that I do currently is around working with organizations and helping them realize additional value, whether that means creating something completely new or going in and transforming something that's already established as a business unit. So currently today, I work at Genentech and I lead their U.S. clinical trial operations organization um, across all of our therapeutic areas, 
which includes oncology, ophthalmology, infectious diseases, immunology, neuroscience, and ophthalmology, as, as well as rare diseases. So any of those trials, any trials that are done in the US that Genentech Roche is doing, is likely sort of my team that's executing those trials. And so I think the perspective that I bring is, is one that the trans uh, sense that goes through academic science and the, uh, the path there that you know, very few people look like me um, are in academic science from the policy world where also too there's not a lot of people who look like us, especially at certain levels. And now sort of in corporate America where the same situation occurs. Um, and I will say that it's been definitely a really interesting these last couple of months to see corporations stand in a different place in regards, especially to their black employees. And we'll sort of love to sort of think about sort of what that means for um, executives in science and in the pharma and biotech industry as well. We'd love to engage in that conversation. And writ large, I think one of the things that I'm also quite focused on sort of day to day too, in terms of having these conversations is having it very directly tied into my day to day work. And that's very specifically diversity in clinical trials. And so I actually co-lead one of our efforts at Genentech around increasing the diversity in our clinical trials and ensuring that our trials don't continue to look like an old white guy, but actually looks like the entire population that we actually have that we're trying to treat, right? If we have a prostate cancer trial or a diabetes trial that doesn't actually look like or doesn't actually represent those patients that actually get prostate cancer at a higher incidence or those patients that actually have diabetes at a higher incidence, for me, I just don't think that we're actually solving the problem or really putting out to the best medicines for our community. And so what we're really trying to address at Genentech is how do we actually ensure that, one, as a publicly traded company, we're looking at the largest market share, but also honestly, too, just solving the, the hardest problems in medicine and really stepping into that space of challenging ourselves to address the entire medical problem and not just the medical problem for some people. So Asha, this problem is particularly important for New York City. Um, yes. This is one of the most diverse cities in the world. And, you know, there's been some companies that have found they can do an entire clinical trial of an ethnic group in New York because so many people live here. Yes. Um, and so that is something that's a strength of our city and something that we should be talking about and building on. Yeah, I would love that. We actually recently, um, so we actually just had a COVID study. We've had a number of COVID studies that we're running, but one very specifically targets, and it, uh, oh gosh, I forget the names of the, I think there was one actually in Jamaica, Queen, a hospital that we actually, and we, that we set a site in, and we basically really, we had a number of COVID trials going on, but this one in particular, we actually identified patients that would be in the highest targeted groups generally underrepresented and definitely underserved. Yeah. And a number of those actually landed in New York because of exactly what you're saying. So the confluence, I guess, of the underserved as well as the diversity. Right. And then it's definitely a conversation to have. And I, I sit on a, leadership, a global leadership team. And so when I'm talking to my colleagues that you know, oversee Europe or oversee Asia Pac or oversee Latin America, I feel like I have a particular charge to have a very different voice at that table because the U.S. has such great diversity. It's a great um, opportunity for us to really drive the company forward because we have access to that diversity very much like New York City does. Yes, so I'd yes. love to continue that conversation. Thank you. Yeah. And lastly to my man, Manny Fombo. <laughs> <laughs> You're on mute, man. You're on mute. We can't hear you. Still on mute. Uh oh. Well, I tell you what, well, Manny, while you work on the um, technical difficulty, see if you can get it working. Just chime in when you're ready. But, um, okay, if you can take it off mute, let us know. But if not, then I'll jump into the first question. We'll come back to you, Manny, with your introduction. Cause you're still on mute. See if you can. Is it better? Now we got oh, you. Perfect, God. perfect, perfect. Oh, perfect. Isn't better. I don't have the big earphones. So that's perfect. So um, background. 
So I am uh, Emmanuel Fumbu, uh, background, I'm a physician, um, and uh, I, I have like another crazy path, right? And, and I think the, the point of my story, it's about the valley of mentorship uh, kind of pieces, right? Like growing up, I mean, I had, my family did this one career option to become a doctor or a bust, <laughs> kind of the, the option, right? I have, I have two younger sisters and they're both physicians as well. Um, so kind of different kind of situation here, but I, um, while in practice, I, uh, and doing research, I got uh, introduced to some people in the industry and I got curious about industry and I had my first role uh, within Bayer Pharmaceuticals um, early on in my career. Time later, I uh, was in New York City from Washington and I met uh, some other physicians that work in the private equity and investment space, right? And they, I was fortunate enough to have mentors there they pulled me into um, the private equity business and uh, investment banking pretty early in my career. But the interesting part of this is none of them were actually blacks, right? These are like all the Jewish men that I met in New York randomly that happened to take me under the umbrella, <laughs> right? And um, exposed me to that. Um, and then we got a couple of deals done. We were, were successful in that. Um, they started a private equity firm, uh, a venture capital firm started a company down in San Francisco, um, sold that company. And then I got very interested in, uh, I got caught up in this world of venture capital and medicine and I thought it was very interesting. So I decided to go to business school and that brought me up to New York, uh, did finance and mergers and acquisitions over at Cornell. And uh, the plan was to go back into uh, investment banking or venture capital. Uh, but I'm a researcher at heart. I got pulled back into industry. I uh, was a Novartis. Um, where I led uh, several clinical trials using devices, technologies um, to track patients. But during that period, when I look across clinical studies that were being done, even in conditions like heart failure, we have like 2% African-Americans, right? In, in the studies with 10,000 patients, right? If you look at studies in diabetes, if you look at studies in all these different areas, you realize that we have absolutely, we don't, we don't have representation, but we all work there, right? So, I mean, we are minorities there, but the same thing reflects in our clinical studies, exactly what happens. And if you look at employment within the minority community in healthcare, the lack of diversity translates into our clinical trials. I'm tired of having all these workshops to discuss how to get minorities in clinical trials. I've been in the thousands of them, okay? Like within industry, <laughs> like to have this conversation and nothing ever changes. At the end of the day, we file reports and put slide decks and talk about it and continue going forward, just like we do over and over again. Nothing ever happens, right? So I think this is a pivotal moment where we need to change this. And so there are two ways of doing it. I mean, doing it within industry or figure out if you have money, you can actually change things that happen. And that's what happens, right? If you have money and power, you can actually influence uh, things. So um, I got curious at that point and I um, left Novartis and I took a, a role over at Johnson & Johnson, uh, working in a, in a global commercial strategy organization and um, checked out and decided to focus more investment banking and uh, venture capital in this particular space in healthcare, because I think we can make the right investments, not just slide decks, right? And how you can change it. And it so happens that recently, if you see what happened with COVID, especially in New York City, right? If you look at the, the death rates among Hispanics and African-Americans within New York City itself, significantly higher than the rest of the population, right? So if we do studies and we say we want to target African-Americans or Hispanics in New York City, yeah, that's because most people are dying. Those are the people that you're going after, right? So is it, is it opportunistic or is it actually a real thing we want to do to make change, right? And I think there's a lot more we can do, right, across the board. So I, I, um, I'm very happy we're having this conversation and, and I hope that the end of this conversation is not just one of those, um, you know, chats that we discuss and then move on. I think, um, you know, having everyone um, that attend this call, that means you actually care about the topic, <laughs> right? And so it's not just looking at, at Asher, Anthony and Mark, myself or Angel, I mean, it's like, let's build something together, right? Uh, or Tim, right? So let's just sit together. I think it takes a community um, to make this happen because we're all friends, right? And so if you look at the Black Lives yeah. of, of Matter movement picking up, it wasn't because only the Blacks were protesting, it was because you had whites and, and, and Asians and everyone coming together to make sure this changes. So I think um, it's a good opportunity and I hope something comes out of this. Perfect, Manny. Listen, we, we definitely appreciate it and very well said. And so I think with that, let's just jump right into it if we can. I think one of the first questions I want to ask, I want to ask this from the entire panel, and it's an amalgamation of questions we, we want to cover and then some I'm grabbing from the audience kind of on the fly here. So the first question is, I think, and, and to Manny's point, we got to make sure we set the baseline of, is this a systemic issue or is it just kind of one-off space, right? And I think that um, we can get to that by looking at it from our own personal experience, right, in terms of what we've experienced, whether it be from mentorships, from 
hostile environments and then also just from a perspective of kind of how we've grown within the industry and I think that um, one of the questions from the audience is is this kind of geographical so for instance Mark you're coming from southern Virginia based right coming up to New York City so have you seen any difference in that environment and then obviously Asha you're out on the west coast um, and and um, Tim coming from the development perspective so let's start there maybe maybe Mark you can chime in and get kind of your perception on is it systemic or not and what are you seeing yeah, I mean, Anthony, thank you. Uh, coming from Virginia, especially, uh, you would think that there may be some systematic differences between New York and there, but Virginia has become definitely more diverse and more uh, liberal in its functioning lately. But what I have seen just in research science in general is that there doesn't seem to be an appeal to people of color to actually go into the field. And I've always wondered why. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, you know, there's probably multifaceted reasons. It could just be, you know, just the amount of time it takes to gain the requisite skill in this field, but it also, you know, pay is not necessarily all that good for most of your career um, until you get to a certain point. Uh, and then there, there's probably, and I brought this up before, but there's probably a lack of mentorship. I think that's really the key for anyone to want to progress in a particular field. Um, it's, it's good to have someone who you can turn to, who you can look up to, who can actually guide you forward. In my case, it was actually a Japanese guy. Um, my mentor, a guy named Hisashi Harada, really taught me everything that I needed to know to become a research scientist. Before this, um, I was a web designer and computer tech. So I really was retrained, as it were, to think like a researcher, to think like a cancer biologist, think like an immunologist. Um, so the the problem, you know, the problem is really getting people into the fold in the first place. Even for those people uh, of African American descent who I mentored during my time, most of them ended up wanting to go to medical school, and they did, and they were very successful, and I was proud of them for that but I didn't see a lot of them want to stick around and do research. And maybe the, they felt that the field was somewhat hostile to them. Funding for research, which I found that they were interested in, which was oftentimes more public health related or epidemiology related patient level, that doesn't seem to be as well supported by the NIH as someone who does uh, cellular science, someone who's doing something that has to start in the incubator and end on your bench top. So there's a, there's a disconnect there too. It's like, well, you may have people who want to pursue something useful, but there's no money behind it. So why would I stay in this field in the first place? I can go do something else with my skills and abilities. So that's my little piece. Um, Annie or Asha or Angel, I don't, how do you all feel? Yeah, I think let's jump, let's throw it to maybe Asha and talk about, we'll, we'll talk about now, but let's go to the pharma side, right? And ask Asha the question. There's a lot of obviously erosion of executives in, in the pharma space. They kind of come and go. What are you seeing in terms of the environment at, the, at Big Pharma and Biotech? Yeah, in, I'm here and on the West Coast now, where I previously was on the East Coast too, and I would say across the board, sort of here, out sort of in, in biotech land and out uh, in the Northeast and sort of pharma land, I, I see the same thing, right? It's very few of us who are executives and everyone has war stories, right? Who, who is still here. And uh, it has been quite interesting, as I was alluding to before, because I think a, a number of these companies are now in the last two months the last sort of six weeks, asking themselves the questions about, um, are, are, is there more to do here? Uh, what does more look like in this situation? And how do we support our, our employees? And how do we actually look at our pipeline? Right? I think there was some comment earlier about, I think Tim made it around, you know, going towards high schools and thinking about the pipeline of talent, and not even just looking at your own internal company um, in the position that you need to hire at this point. I would say overall, I think pharma and biotech have a long way to go in this regard. I think there's probably potentially the um, a beginning of understanding that there is actually a problem. Um, actually, I was quite proud of Genentech at some level last year because they actually published their numbers in terms of their ethnicity. 
and they publish it not just writ large, but they also publish it at sort of the different levels. So you can see how many executives, how many directors, how many managers, um, and then also how many individual contributors. And it was quite clear that they have a long way to go to get to anything that's representative. I do, there, there seems to be um, across the board. I think one, that shouldn't be, first of all, anything that I, anyone should applaud someone for, right? That should just be done, right? And we're in this position now, we're applauding people for doing things that are kind of common sense or just good corporate citizenship, right? Um, so that's sort of where we are. And it's not clear to me that writ large as an industry, we know really how to move forward. It, even when we're looking at a lot of the movements that have been happening lately, right? There's a, for, to me, it seems a clear pathway and understanding that we really need to look internally and help create less hostile environments, more inclusive and welcoming environments for people and not just mentor people, but also sponsor people, help people understand what sponsorship actually means. And also really ensure that not just we're bringing people in, but we're bringing people in into an environment that they actually deserve. I sometimes get a little bit cautious about saying we need to have more you know, underrepresented people in some of these environments that are not welcoming to people, that are not healthy, honestly, for people. Right? I think we really need to focus on creating better, healthier environments for people that can then sort of pull people into um, these different environments because they are quite, they can be quite impactful, quite powerful, and also quite lucrative as well. So I say there's, there's acknowledgement that's happening, and I think there's more work to do. And I'll also say, I don't think that work has to do with creating separate external funds that can grow, but not actually addressing the actual systems that are actually being owned by biotech and pharma. May I jump in um, at, at this point? I, I you know, I think it's really important at this moment in time that we have an honest analysis of what of what this is all about. I mean, there's, you know, between Mark and Asha and I think Manny, there is a trend, right? And there's no accident as to why there's a trend and a pattern. And I think what we have to do better, what we have to be better at is unpacking why this is so from a systems thinking perspective. I think where, what we're not talking about are the undiscussable norms and values that um, really uphold particular mental models that influence the development of structures and policies and practices which lead to specific experiences that that people have and so what, what am i really saying i'm saying that i think quite frankly in science that excellence is just not a black or brown individual it's just not a, an excellent scientist SNAP Association is not a black or brown individual, bottom line. And I think the, um, what's upholding that is that there are norms and values that are rewarded in science and particularly in professions like medicine and science, that is that such as power hoarding of knowledge, like you're rewarded for that, mm -hmm. right? But if you don't know that that's a norm or a value that is valued in that culture and that profession, then you would never be successful in that, in that road. And so, you know, if, if it's um, perfectionism, uh, individualism, paternalism, you know, uh, worship of the written word, right? Publications matter. Like if you didn't know that the landscape, that those norms and values are deeply embedded in the structure, yeah. policies and practices, then you will sink. You will never be successful. And so, yes, the, 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 the tipping points and the things that may help are mentorship, yeah. But that's a fix it solution. That's not a redesign of the system. Even diversity affairs offices, we exist because of racism. So, you know, the truth is, is that it's really about how do we redesign systems so that the values and norms of those systems really support um, an inclusive environment. And, 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 and that, that, that is, so it's deeply embedded inside of the system and doesn't just get layered on as a fix it solution. And Asha, to your point, you know, having um, all of these reactions by companies in the last six weeks, because it is a reaction. It's not being proactive. It's a reaction mm -hmm. to a system mm -hmm. that, um, was, that, 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 that didn't really unpacking really clearly say, wow, you know, what we reward is just, it's just not black and brown excellence in science and medicine. We just don't reward that. We don't value that. And that is undiscussable. And so I think we need to talk about that. 
And Jill, I agree. I'm wondering if you could comment on kind of um, the reverse impact of actually succeeding, you know, as a person of color and then, you know, having your success uh, be basically attributed to, oh, it's because you're black. Um, we have one comment here from uh, Willie Underwood who says, I've been in academia as a clinician scientist. The environment is hostile to blacks. Um, sorry about that. Um, if those who are expected to mentor blacks believe that black lack the intelligence to be scientists, then our efforts don't go anywhere. I was told that all my success was not because I worked hard and had good ideas, but because they needed a black person, so I received the grant and my paper was published. By the way, I heard this from my so-called mentors. Look at the hiring practices of the academic centers. They don't hire blacks and they don't promote them. You wanna comment on that? I, mean, I feel like my comments, I uh, appreciate you. The, the question, and I feel like my, my comment, my answer would be the same. You know, it's, it's pointing to the systemic um, structures that are in place. And what we have to do is, is that individuals have positional power in a system, whether it's a pharma company or a, uh, or an, or a research organization, is that they have the positional power to redesign practices such as hiring, redesign policies such as uh, uh, academic promotion and appointments. So I would love to hear from other colleagues, Manny and Nasha and, and Mark. Sure, I, I will. Um, I... Absolutely, what you said, Andrew. One of my, um, I, uh, I, I will. I was on a team, and two of us, right, as the lead performance it was myself, and I have one of my very good friends actually, who's, who happens to be white, and uh, because we're great performers, uh, um, except he had a, he had a different program. His program had um, a one-on-one -on -one individual coach that coached him, right, like 360, and then he got moved, um, you know, to a different role. I got put into the minority development program. Okay, when I walked into the room for my program, they had all the blacks and his and uh, Asians and everyone else that was had a three and above rating that year in the room. So all of us in this room, and this it was a three day workshop. The first day they told us about the, uh, about um, discrimination. So I'm wondering why you bring all the minorities in the room to tell us about discrimination. Like why you <laughs> spending the whole day of my life telling me about discrimination? Like, and so they spend three days torturing your head and making you like actually shrink more. Like you're not empowering me. I want to learn about skills to succeed. I don't want to hear about the fact that I'm a minority and keep on in my head as, as a thing. Um, that's, that's the first part. In the evening, the way they did it was they had executives from the company that were supposed to be mentors, right? They were supposed to come in and have like one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Guess what? None of them showed up to this thing. They, they sent their representatives to re represent them. They didn't take it serious. <laughs> they were not even there right, to show up in our program. And so if they show up, they come to check a box, right? And then they have follow-up meetings, one-on-one -on -one kind of meetings to touch base and see how you're doing. It's not a serious development program. I mean, you see other development programs taking place within a company. I don't want to be considered a black. I don't want to be considered a person of color. I want to be, I just want a fair balance shake. That's all I want, <laughs> right? If I'm a good performer, then I should go to the regular promotion road. I should not be put in a separate group to then fight against other minorities to show that we are minorities and think different. So I think sometimes companies want to come up with a solution, but the problem is so systematic that even in solving the problem, they actually make it worse. Yeah. And that's a good point, man. I think one question I want to ask is, as this is across the table, because it talks about, I think the systemic aspect of what, what Angel was speaking to. So it, at the company level, when those decisions are being made around hiring more minorities or having a more diverse workforce, who's around that table? So, I mean, we also, we always know statistics around kind of CEOs and board levels, especially in the biotech spe sector. There's actually over 60% of companies out there that don't even have uh, a black or brown representative on any of their boards or their senior management. So that's one thing. And I think I'm gonna throw this one actually over to Tim. So, so Tim, you talked about obviously the, the companies you work in, they're usually family owned and start from the bottom and grow up. But let's speak to the aspect of um, when you're in senior leadership, how do you actually bring about some of your friends and colleagues, right, and get those hired so that it addresses that pipeline issue? That's a great question, actually. And, 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 and kind of to go back to the point that I was making, um, just really quickly, what I was saying about 
commercial real estate companies is that at their nucleus, they've started a small business. You look at like a New York SL Green. It's now like a large company, one of the largest uh, property owners in New York. But SL Green is like a person. So that company grew from this family business. And my point is that as it grew, you're obviously just going to keep attracting people that you know or people who know them. So it becomes very, very difficult for minorities to kind of get any scale, so to speak, in the commercial real estate business, let alone the capital. But with regards to your direct question, as sponsor of the Diversity Network at Ventos, it's one of the things we spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time talking about. And I think the answer is you need more diverse slates of candidates when you interview. Because what happens is that any company can have a true desire to diversify. But then what happens is like, okay, we're gonna interview for this position, we're gonna bring five people in, and then they bring in one minority. So, so what happens is that the, inter the managers who are interviewing, all the things they're thinking in their head is that this is a check the box interview because they said I needed to interview a minority candidate, but they're never really given true consideration. But what happens is if you have two or three on a slate of five, now you're comparing people against each other based on their merits and their experience uh, versus just looking at it as a minority candidate. So in order for that to happen, you need more people and the power structure kind of dictating what you're gonna do and how you're gonna bring these slates. And as an example, our CEO, Debbie Cafaro, this is a issue that is near and dear to her heart, thankfully. And one of the things that she's decided is that we are no longer gonna use recruiters who don't bring a diverse slate of candidates. So you kind of have to combine it with your desire to do the right thing with economics, because that's really what's going to make people sit up and take notice. So when people hear that, they're like, okay, now I need to be more aggressive and assertive about finding qualified minority candidates versus, okay, if they need five people, I'll just send one. Because at the end of the day, recruiters are really just looking for the low hanging fruit because they get paid a fee when a job gets filled. So that's, there's really no kind of impetus for them to be, uh, have a diversity mindset unless you kind of dictate from the client perspective what you're going to do about it. So, this sort of money issue, right, is really important to talk about, or this incentivization and financial aspect of, of this, right? Because I think at some level, we we all you know know that this is sort of the, the the right thing to do, but also too, I think when when you ask the question like who's sitting at these tables, I mean my sort of provocative answer in my head was like people who can't read and people who don't do math well, right? Because when we think about the demographics and we think about the research that we know about high performing teams and the trajectory of our industries, all of the industries really, we know that that means that we have to get diverse talent into the door, period, or else all of these industries will falter. And if we don't move towards that, we're not going to do it. And when I talk about these topics, especially within my company, I don't talk about it as in our commitment to people. I talk about it, our commitment to our shareholders. I talk about it to our commitment to being a publicly traded company and we have to really think about the best long-term interests of this company. And there's no way that we can continue on the current path and in 2032, 2045, I think we're also gonna still be successful. It's just not going to happen, it doesn't add up. Yeah, I think that that's an important point, right? I think the important point is all about performance and this is about literally about the bottom line and about success of industries as a whole. Um, so can I add, let me- sorry, sorry, can I add one more addendum to that piece too? Yeah. Just because I think it goes back to, I think what the, Manu, the point Manu was making as well too, or, and I think someone else was making too, just around you know how they've always been told that the reason why they've gotten X, Y, Z is because of their, their background. I think that's an important piece for us to, to tackle too. And, you probably all sort of had those experiences. I know very early on in my career, I became um, maniacal about quantifying my impact, right? Because I was, you are, you can't tell me that I lowered operational expenses by 33.2% because I'm a black woman. Like those numbers actually went down. So when we talk about my success, I am very clearly able to articulate how I helped the business in a quantifiable way that translates to the very value that this company is trying to drive. 
And I think for all of us who are looking to navigate through these worlds, I think that part is really important to think about what is the value that this company, this organization cares about, and how do I unequivocally show that I've driven that value as well. And of course, there's always going to be somebody who's like, oh, well, overall, like, the market went down or something like that, right? But again, like there's always going to be that, but for people who can, again, be present for the truth and be open to that, you can have that information, you can have that data, right? We're scientists, we're clinicians, researchers, we care about data. So, so make sure you have yours. Perfect. Hey, can I pick you back on that real quick, really quickly? Um, I thought about something that and Angel kind of triggered this thought for me. One of the other things that we're seeing in a reaction to BLM is that, you know, people want to do more hiring, but the question needs to be asked is at what level? Because as you go up that pyramid, the numbers decrease dramatically. So companies will say we have, you know, 10% of our employees are people of color, but which 10%? So it's also important that from a top down perspective, there's more people in the room who are going to drive this diversity decision and people who are people of color because what happens is this syndrome, you become the lonely only, you're the only one. And the other thing is, as people of color who are in these positions, and I include myself in this, we also have to make sure we don't allow our colleagues to subscribe to like the Uber Negro theory. It's what I call when they say, oh, Tim, this is so great, you know, so great that you're here and, and they want to make me very special because it kind of justifies how they process the fact that we are more similar than they th ever thought they could be with a black person. So then it becomes, well, you, you must be so dramatically different than other places. Like, no, there's tons of people like me. They just didn't have the opportunities through things like systemic racism and just, you know, inferior educational opportunities. And I drive that point all the time because in a lot of cases, sadly, for colleagues, I'm like the only black person that they know. So it's incumbent on me to make sure they understand that given a level playing field, the workforce would look a, look a lot more like society does. Yeah, yeah. totally. I mean, it's also a two-way thing, right? I mean, I make it a point like in, in the city, for example, if I'm having dinner with uh, my friends that are not uh, black or, uh, or not from the US or from other parts of my company, I take them to Harlem. We have dinner in Harlem. <laughs> right? It's not because they don't want to go to Harlem, but they've, they've been in New York City, but they've not been to Harlem. So we go to Harlem and we have some food in different places, we walk around, we check out, you know, some reggae spots, we check out, you know, some Senegalese restaurants to, to get the full culture of Harlem, right? And so now I've, I've seen, I have a friend at Microsoft, for example, that lives in Switzerland. Every time he comes back down, he has students come from, like, to go to NYU, they'll have all their meetings in Harlem, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I think coming around, understand the culture as well. I think it's a two-way thing, right? We have to meet people halfway to make them understand us better. And Manny, listen, I want you to keep on that thread because that's the point I want to get to, right? I think this is, this is going to be kind of a, a question. I'm going to start with you, then we're going to go to Asha, then Angel, and then follow back up with Tim. And here's the, the question. Um, when you look at this disaggregation of the workforce, right? So this now remote workforce that's being driven by COVID, and also obviously where the majority of development takes place is not obviously in our communities. But there is a thread that is taking place in that, like, for instance, you heard Asha talk about we went into Jamaica, Queens to do a clinical trial there base, right? So it's always this going out, coming in, when right there in the community is where both the economic development needs to take place, the healthcare delivery, and everything that goes along the job creation um, paradigm. So when we talked before, man, and you were talking about some of the things around kind of that healthcare is moving out of the hospital and into the community. Can you speak on that? And then I want Asha to talk a bit about the clinical trial aspect of it. Sure, that, that is great. Um, actually, when COVID uh, started, I was fortunate, I don't know, by, ran, by random chance, I guess I was the only black doctor in you. So the kind of question is, I have this radio show on Hot 97 in New York City, right? Uh, Hot 97, which is like an urban hip hop radio station. And as I'm there with like Ja Rule doing a radio show about COVID, right, the educated community. And so, so going there, I, I realized I've been in New York City for about seven years. I have never actually been to any project ever <laughs> in New York City, right? And so I decided we have all these death rates coming up, so I'm going to go on a tour. So um, the crew at Hot 97 on Fox uh, New York City took me on a tour, and I spent an entire weekend visiting all the, the, the projects from the Bronx all the way down to Brooklyn, and, and, and I spent time in these communities. And for the first time, 
I will tell you, I mean, I was a black person. I mean, people thought I'd been there and I had never been. I met people one-on-one -on -one and had conversations with people that were worried that they have people, elderly people living in those apartments that are probably dead. And they had no one that would actually see them. And they would not find out until the summertime when they don't come out before they know what happened to them, right? They have no one taking care of them. Um, I saw another gentleman that was leading the community project there that had both of his legs amputated. He had diabetes. He told me he went from a four-year period without ever drinking water because soda was cheaper than water in the exact same community, <laughs> right? Uh, we have people that right where they live, across the street, you have dialysis clinics, but you don't have hospitals. Dialysis clinics because they have Medicaid that pays for, their, for, for dialysis, so everyone is camping around there to, to make money from them. That's exactly what's happening in their communities, right? And so I didn't know this until you, you go and you see what happens. There's no, absolutely nothing that comes across prevention and being proactive about healthcare, right? And so in healthcare, we know people that died from COVID, for example, had diabetes, have hypertension. We are doing absolutely nothing to provide anything for that community, to make it feel better for them. And the best way to do that is to engage people in their healthcare environment, right? I, I know uh, Eric, I uh, saw earlier, Eric Limpa and Mount Sinai, and I've done a lot of work with Mount Sinai, for example, with innovative teams about being proactive about healthcare. How do we prevent diabetes from happening? How do we prevent, uh, you know, heart failure, hypertension from happening within our communities? And th those are opportunities by itself. There's a lot of investment going on today in telemedicine, right? Digital health kind of things, bunch of venture money. The highest uh, population that costs the most amount of money is the minority patients. They're the minority patients. But research is being done in Stanford, <laughs> right? In Cambridge, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. In Westchester, Long Island. So how do we make that, how do we become more proactive in, a, in our environment and engage people where they are? So I think it's very important uh, to look at things. No, that's a good point. And before I go to you, Ash, I'm going to go to Angel, because Angel has an innovative program, I think, over in Spanish, Harlem, and some of the things she's talking about with this whole system, right, and breaking the infrastructure. I wonder if you can speak on that, Angel, from that perspective. If I go. This um, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's um, I have so many other thoughts running through my head. I think, you know, there's no accident as to why black and brown communities are the hardest hit. Um, and again, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a part of a, a consistent, persistent pattern and trend. And when you unpack that, you know, you're looking at communities, we're already a highly dense city. Uh, and you have people, multiple generations of people living in a small living spaces and sharing space. And so what happens is that what COVID revealed, it revealed the system onto itself in terms of what worked and what didn't work and what, what processes we thought we had in place and structures we had in place. And in fact, what really was revealed is that actually sheltering at home or quarantine is actually a privilege. Like that, that's a privilege that you can have to stay alive. I mean, there's no accident as to why, you know, there was no real guidance that came out for, um, you know, how do you stay safe while sharing space? And in East Harlem, we've done, we've done a lot of work around emergency preparedness. And, and the hidden agenda behind that is that black and brown communities are always the first to get hit by some type of natural disaster or even a public health emergency and the last to reconstruct. And neighborhoods like East Harlem was, you know, the highest positive COVID case, uh, highest uh, number of positive COVID cases in any of the zip code in, in Manhattan and continues to be that. And that is because the pre-existing vulnerability of the neighborhood as a low resource historically minority community on top of compounded by a pandemic, again, there's no accident. So yes, all the underlying conditions that Manny saw of individuals living in public housing, which by the way, East Harlem has the highest concentration of public housing in any neighborhood in Manhattan. You know, again, it is all there and so, yeah. You know, it's not a surprise, and I think what Nate really this is about, particularly around addressing um, the, the 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 response to COVID in minority communities hardest hit, is that we have to think about the recovery at the same time as response, and mm -hmm. and thinking about what what could organizations like Mount Sinai really do in getting in front of, you know, then the second wave, the surge, and really think about. Um, what are the structures that we can create to create better access to our healthcare services, to create, um, to be more accessible with information um, and be more of a public good in, in the expertise that we have within our organization and disseminate that out. And I think we're, we're working on that on multiple levels, both uh, within our research infrastructure, our academic structure, and of course our healthcare delivery structure. Good to hear, good to hear. Um, with that, I'll throw it to Asha and then from there up to Nancy, because I want to hear your, your thoughts on this subject as well. 
Yeah, I feel a bit like Angel. I feel like there's so many different sort of streams of thoughts I'm having right now. This is a really great conversation. Um, and I guess maybe I'll also start with saying that I'm actually super, super excited yet again that this is actually part of what like NYC builds because I think it's such a great um, one sort of analogy, but also a fundamental part of what actually needs to change because it is, to Angel's point, systemic. Right, and we really definitely have to think about putting on sort of our builder's hat in regards to how we need to address this. Because in so many ways, it's like we're hearing bombs outside, so we're just putting on new windows, right? Instead of actually saying like, what is actually happening outside and what do we actually need to change systemically to actually change this? So I'll answer the question that you actually asked me, which is around clinical trials and going to the patient, especially during this time. And I think what we've, we found, but really reflects on what I just said too, is that we don't know what we're doing, right? And I think really because we're, we haven't, as companies, we haven't gotten to the fact we're really, un, we haven't gotten to the point where we're really unpacking what the actual problem is in terms of healthcare obstacles. So we're putting in place solutions that actually don't address the actual issue. So for example, I think initially, or at some level, some people were very excited about telehealth, especially for underserved patient populations, right? Not understanding that some patients live in crowded housing situations where them taking off their clothes or showing parts of their bodies isn't necessarily appropriate, either because of crowded conditions or religious reasons or what have you, right? But again, just diversity. And then the other piece of it too is that they might not have the bandwidth for it. Their phones might not have plans that can support that bandwidth. Or if we're looking to, for example, in our case, where we didn't, you know, we have thousands of people on experimental medicine and then COVID hit, right? What, how do we find these people? How do we make sure they can get their medicines, right? So we're like, well, we can ship them to their homes, right? If we ship it to the projects, like how effective will that be, right? Or just other places too. I grew up in Detroit. I knew there are places where the post office did not go. Right, and so we have to really think about this, again, with user design in mind, with a builder's mindset. How do people who actually inhabit, how do people actually use our products actually live? And to step into this unknown and to, and to really understand that there's a huge diversity that we don't, as companies, don't understand. And that why some of these amazing telemedicine things sound really great and are, for some patients, they do not actually create a level playing field. Nancy, any thoughts on your side? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's participated in this discussion. Um, I don't want to say for helping us understand, because frankly, it's not your job to help us understand. Um, but I think that this conversation has raised the issues so that people maybe who did not understand the extent of the problem have some additional ideas about what it is now. And I really hope that this isn't just a conversation. I mean, I've heard several of you say that. And when I opened this dialogue, I mean, I, I pointed out the fact that investment in life science infrastructure in New York City is going to double by $1.3 billion over the next several years. And I think one way that we can start to affect change is for each of you to get your organizations involved in our organization as members um, and to take leadership on our committees and to you know, voice your opinions about um, channels for the future that could create constructive change help the companies that are part of our membership to reach out to the networks that you have so that people that you do know about the schools and you know the technical training programs that you're aware of uh, they can become aware of so they can utilize them and you know in bringing your companies in as um, as supporters and sponsors of the organization you know to help us promote that, uh, diversity and that message that really needs to get out into the marketplace. And so I would encourage all of you to continue to be involved and just thank you so much for agreeing to participate here this afternoon. So we promised our, um, our uh, guests to 
uh, split up into randomized rooms so that they all have a chance to talk to each of you or to talk to each other. And um, so Anthony, are you finished with your questions or was there something else that you wanted to cover? You're muted. Yeah, no, so I wanted to open it up to two things. One, I want to open it up. I sent an uh, invite out to anyone who has questions for the panelists right now during this discussion. Okay. And then I think what we can do is while we're waiting for questions from the audience, I'll leave it to kind of final thoughts from um, the panelists. So if we can maybe start with Tim and go around the, the room with any kind of thoughts on, um, well, let's see here. Oh, perfect, here we go. So one question is from Nicole Walker. What can those of us who are not at the executive level do to make changes within our organizations? And I'll open it up to everyone on the panel. So the question is, what can we do as individuals to kind of help solve these problems if we're not at the executive level? Uh, I'll take that. I'll start with that one. I, I think that it's, um, as I said, it's, it's incumbent on us, uh, people of color, to, to kind of continue to have the dialogue. And, it, and, I, and I don't say that lightly because I know it's tricky. These conversations get uncomfortable. Um, but I think to Nancy's point, to, to kind of move things forward, we're going to have to, and I think Asha made the same point as well, have to start having these uncomfortable conversations because otherwise we're just going to keep putting a Band-Aid you know, but on a, on a knife wound. I mean, the, the reality is there are systemic issues and, and now is really kind of the time because one of the things that the current movement has really kind of pulled the blinders back. So now people, you know, I, I find it weird when people say, it's like, oh my God, it's, you know, I can't believe these things were going on. It's like, yeah, we've been talking about it forever. So it's not, this is not new. But the fact that now it, the spotlight is on and the blinders are off, I think it's just continuing to have the conversations and, you know, not be bashful about it and just, you know, be willing to be uncomfortable. And it, it's like you said, like people say, you can never have progress without getting outside of your comfort zone. And that's kind of what you have to do, especially if you're not in a position of power. And it can be in small groups just with your own team members. I agree with Tim, just to parley off that, you know, you, if you're not in a position of power and you want to be, sometimes you just have to speak up. And that's oftentimes the difference between getting somewhere and being left behind. Um, that's not always the easy route to go, but if you really feel strongly about your opinion and you feel that the way you view things will actually change uh, the way things work going forward then it's, I think it's, it's part of your right, but it's part of your job and your opportunity to really share your thoughts and share your viewpoints on how to make progress. Great. And, and I think there's another question. I, I'll throw this one too on to Asha. This one from Cindy Green at Connecticut Innovation. I think it speaks, we'll put you on the spot for your project you're working on. So her question is, they, um, they, they fund, they're quasi public agents, they fund investments in new technologies, fintech, biotech, et cetera, and they struggle to find diversity in portfolio companies. So maybe if you can speak to some of the ideas around um, this, both the database and thoughts around how do we get pipelines for everyone who's looking for minorities but can't find them. Yeah, no, thank you so much for this. So outside of my sort of day job, one of the other things I'm, I'm passionate about is actually investing in, in underrepresented founders, specifically who are leading healthcare ventures. And so I work with a number of different colleagues who actually uh, have a database of these thought leaders and these entrepreneurs in this space, as well as um, ad underrepresented um, founders, the funders, as well as venture capitalists. And so if you're interested in diversifying your portfolio, uh, please reach out to me. Um, I'll put my email in the, the chat as well too, or I'll reach out to you, Cindy. But for anyone, it's honestly just ashacollins at gmail. We have a, a number, we have a, a library basically of entrepreneurs that we work with. And I got into this because I became an angel investor and being in, in large healthcare organizations, I often saw healthcare startups pitching who had these beautiful curves for how they were gonna get returns that would be based off of a large underrepresented population. And they didn't have any people of color on their leadership on their boards, on their advisors. And when the question was ever asked, they never saw that it was necessary. And so I just really think it's important for us to at least ensure that we're enabling people who are part of these communities to have 
funds to create their own solutions, at least have a solution that's, again, based in a user design of the actual broadest population of users. And so because of that, I've gone out and looked for healthcare entrepreneurs that are underrepresented and see how we can get them additional funding, how we can connect them to resources, advisors, as well as funders. So please feel free to reach out to me. Perfect. Thank so, you. Thanks, Asha. So what, before we go into the, um, the, the, the separate rooms, um, Nancy, maybe we'll go through and have kind of final thoughts from, from every um, kind of panelist, right, in terms of just not the obviously, um, what, 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 what's the one action if you had kind of a magic wand you would do? What's the one action you would start right now to start making change and taking advantage of this opportunity we have to not only continue this dialogue, but have very frank discussions around the inequities that exist within healthcare and how to solve them. So um, I, I think um, I'll start with maybe Manny and then we'll work around the room. Well, as a final thought, I, I think it's it's important for us to have more of these conversations. I, I'm very happy to see the, the diversity of people that actually join this kind of conversation. Um, and, you know, like uh, I've been following, I think a diversity hub, for example, I think Angel, the, the, the co-founder of, for example, those are interesting things in the city. Being in the investment space, I think seeing those kind of um, in, innovation hubs within communities that actually solve problems, having this kind of network and, and, and diversify that network, I think that's the best first step. Right, and I shall be reaching out as well. So that's great. Perfect, okay. Mark? Yes, so, uh, you know, one strong point that Manny made a while ago was, you know, how COVID- Just one? I thought I Just made one. Well, you had many, many, but just this <laughs> one. Um, you know, you brought up how COVID, I think in a lot of ways it's due to COVID that, these types of conversations are happening um, is where does that may sound you know the outbreak kind of made us all self isolate but it also made us aware of situations like George Floyd's and other systematic problems that we were seeing and you know we became much more aware of Black Lives Matter if we weren't already but I think in reality we were seeing, you know, an issue with basic human civil rights. And I think that's actually where things are uh, needed to be changed the most, obviously. And I, I hope that this type of conversation continues. I hope that people from all colors and backgrounds and religions and wherever you're from continue to participate because it's really a group effort to make changes. Um, I can't do it alone. Uh, the panel couldn't do it alone, but you know, as a group effort, we can absolutely uh, improve conditions for everybody. Um, and I'm glad to keep participating in forums like this. And I'm glad to speak with anyone who would like to speak to me. So there you go. Thanks, Mark. Asha? I, I would say the one thing is, is that's the question, right? What's the one thing that we've take away from to do yeah i think that the one thing to do is whatever organization that we're a part of to start asking questions right like whether you're a decision maker or whether you're an individual contributor to start asking questions again based on some of the values of that company and it's very hard for me from me being academia to government to non to ngos to now corporate america there hasn't been one organization where their value hasn't actually been tied to this topic, right? Diversifying their workforce for sustainability. So I definitely believe it in going to following the money. And I feel like for this, the, the greatest impact, the sustainable impact will be to understand how within your organization where you stand today, how do you follow the money and tie this issue to the money and the success and value of your organization. For me, that's what I'm looking into every day and also looking for people who are saying that this, these things matter to them, going to them and saying, then show me the money. Yeah, I'll give you my point in with order Angel. So for me, I think one thing we can do is if everyone, for instance, on this, both this, um, this, this chat can identify, for instance, three, I will challenge you to identify three executives that are African-American Latino in your industry. And, and the question is, how long does it take to identify those three people? 
And um, if, if it takes longer than, you know what I'm saying, a day, then that really shows, I think, kind of exemplifies a problem that we have, right? And I think to Manny's point, it goes above and beyond just kind of mentorship and things like that to actually start establishing friendships and real relationships. And that would be my challenge, just to identify three black or brown executives within your industry. Joe, over to you. Um, I think what I like to offer is that for anyone on this Zoom who has um, pos positional power, who oversees, um, you know, structures and components of an organization, and um, I invite you to ref deeply reflect and think through like what values are manifesting inside of those structures, policies, and practices, and consider, uh, you know, you know what what the yield is of that, and and if it's actually enabling inequity and a, and actually enabling and perpetuating um, a diverse, inclusive environment, I invite you to, um, to 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 shift and redesign and step into that in, in, a, in a courageous way, because this is this requires systems cha change, and it requires it requires a commitment from individuals who do have positional power within a system. And for those individuals who don't have positional power, I just want to say there is a strategy around influencing without authority. And that is also a really key strategy uh, around, you know, really know, under having a, an expertise, building relationships, and having a way to, to deconstruct the landscape and, this, and the environment and, and, the, and the circumstances in a way that really unpacks it from a systems perspective. And I think that, that my role, I, you know, I, I really found that to be a successful strategy is to influence without authority. I mean, we are a health system officers inclusion, but we don't oversee HR. We don't oversee, you know, particular clinical or research departments. We are really embedded and connected throughout the organization. And so we're constantly working at influencing without sort of systemic positional authority. And I invite those who, who are on this um, and have been part of listening to the discussion. So just sit back and reflect and see where you can help redesign a system that you are a part of. Any last thoughts, Tim? Um, I, I appreciate the challenge of, uh, that Anthony put out. I think from, from our perspective, it's continuing to make sure our development projects don't exclude those in the surrounding communities. We do a lot of our work, as you said, as university adjacent, and a lot of those schools, albeit Ivy League schools, sit very close to underserved communities. So, like for instance, what CIC, our tenant CIC does with the first hand program, continue to make bridges around the community um, members, around these developments that we're doing versus building these psychological barriers and moats that make people who live there feel like they're being displaced and this really has nothing to do with them. So I really applaud our development partners for being um, strategic in that way. And I just want to continue to keep kind of driving that and, and working with them on more programs that are going to be more inclusive because it's very easy for us to build these bright, shiny buildings and the people who live four blocks away feel like it has nothing to do with them. And so we really need to be cognizant of the residents around the developments that we're doing. Well, well said, and thank you again, everyone. I hope that you all will continue to be part of our conversation and exercise your influence in our organization and in our industry here in New York City. So please, please stay apart. And uh, we'll, we will organize additional events to continue this conversation and include all of you and others. Um, so now, Carolina, can you put us into our rooms? And we will keep them open for as long as you guys want to go. Uh, we were scheduled to stop at 2.30, but we don't need to. So um, feel free to continue the conversation. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>